place the flowers in the vase that you bought today. You are listening to New Culture Radio. I am your host, Dan Schultz. This week I am uh, happy to have Jim Rogers, American businessman, investor, traveler, financial commentator, and author. Uh, how you doing, Jim? I'm fine, Dan. How are you? Good, uh, good mo- well, this morning here. I guess it's evening there. Good evening. You are talking from Singapore, am I correct? I am in Singapore. It is now 10.30 in the morning here, yes. You know, let's talk Trump. Trump, is he the real deal? Is the new boss the same as the old boss? Maybe you could rate his first few weeks. Do you think there's going to be any real change? How do you see him? Well, when you say the old boss, you mean the old Trump or the old uh, Obama? Uh, He's certainly, I hope he's different from the Obama. Obama didn't do much for the United States or for the world, as you know. Mr. Trump has said, Mr. Trump has said he's going to question everything. He's to use this term, he's going to drain the swamp. And uh, fortunately, a lot of people believed him, uh, including me. I'm afraid he, so far, he hasn't done it. He's been like any other politician, you know. He hasn't done the things he said. He said he was going to put a 45% tariff on China the first day, the same with Mexico. He was going to have trade wars with Japan and Korea. He didn't do any of those things. In fact, he's turned around and said, oh, my gosh, the Japanese and the Koreans we love and adore. Um, I, you know, the things that he's, those things would not be good, by the way, but he promised us he was going to do them. I, for one, acted, I believed him and thought he would do them. Uh, not that I wanted him to. He hasn't done them, so I've missed some opportunities because of that. You know, the one time in my life, Dan, that I believe a politician, he turns out to be like the rest of them. He he just tells tells us lies. Uh, We'll see. Uh, I don't know. So far, he hasn't. He did attack immigration to some extent, but even that has not been effective, and even that was not very good. So, so far, the jury's out. He said a lot of things, some of them good things, some of them bad things. So far, he has not done the things he promised us he was doing. That's the same with all politicians, Dan. It does appear. I mean, I was happy that he put an end to the, T- the TPP, and I was happy to see him take some efforts towards uh, securing our borders. Um, but that's about it, isn't it? He, uh, he completely, instead of draining the swamp, he filled it with the worst of the worst, with the Goldman Sachs gang and every globalist he could find so i'm i'm equally as disappointed as it sounds like you are well it doesn't matter whether i'm disappointed or not uh, i am disappointed he didn't tell us the truth so yes i'm disappointed that he didn't or i shouldn't say he didn't tell the truth that he didn't do what he said he was going to do because i thought he would and i believed it and i acted as much yes i'd forgotten about tpd tpp he did promise he would end that and he did end that the first day. I'm not sure what he's done about our borders. You say he secured our borders. I haven't seen uh, anything effective or useful, but the other stuff he hasn't done. I mean, he's, he's brought in a lot of guys, some of whom apparently are smart guys, but not much has happened. Yeah. And maybe the worst of it is he does appear to be posturing for war. He's increased the troops in Europe and his dialogue with regarding the Iranians, which is what I want to get into next, um, does not appear, appear as if he's going to be the peace president. And I'm fearing, like Obama, who won the Nobel Peace Prize, they're nominating Trump for a Nobel Peace Prize, and I'm, I'm fearing that here they're doing that under similarly ridiculous uh, terms. Um, as you probably well know, Obama's acceptance speech for the Nobel Peace Prize was completely extolling the virtues of war in, in an Orwellian fashion. So, um, I don't know. Yeah, it's disappointing, but um, how do you feel about Iran getting out of U.S. dollars, the petrodollar, um, how this might change um, the global economic chessboard 
Well, I guess we were all uh, shocked that Mr. Obama got the Nobel Peace Prize, including him, <laughs> because he hadn't done anything to deserve it. And since then, I think the record would show he's gotten us more into more wars than any other American president, or nearly any other American president. So that was uh, certainly not deserved, and unfortunately, he's not going to give it back, and they're not going to take it back. But I'm surprised that surprised Mr. Trump has been nominated at all. I doubt that Mr. Trump will get it. But what you're right, Mr. Trump seems to be very taking very aggressive stances with a lot of people. Uh, he did say to the Japanese now, he originally said, we're going to pull the troops out of Japan and we're not going to pay for that kind of thing anymore. The next thing you know, he's <laughs> swearing allegiance to the Japanese and likewise the South Koreans. Now, we spend a lot of money having 40,000 troops in South Korea and thousands of troops in Japan. I'm not sure why they're there, Dan. The Second World War ended over 70 years ago. So while we're still occupying Japan is a mystery to me. The Korean War ended well over 60 years ago. And why we're still occupying South Korea is beyond me. Or certainly while we're paying for it, much less being there. Iran. The Iranians were doing everything they could, especially young Iranians, to be friendly with America and American people. Now all of a sudden he's slapping them in the face again. I, I don't understand it. I know that most countries out there would like to be friends with us. Most countries don't want to have war with us. Why the people in Washington keep rousing these warlike things, I, I have no idea, especially since you and I have to pay for it of Alibaba, whose name is Jack, I guess you know Alibaba, the company, it's a huge yes. successful internet company. Jack Ma said the other day in a speech, listen America, you spent over $14 trillion on wars in the last 30 years, you've killed tens of thousands of your people and others, and now you're asking why you have problems? <laughs> look, look at the facts, and he's right. I'm not sure what we've gained, if anything, from all these wars in the past 30 or 40 years, except gigantic deaths and a lot of dead young kids. Well, all the wars seem to be uh, some type of leverage for our banksters or our corporations to, you know, American interests, in quotation marks, seems to be uh, a code word for profiting and gaining more control of the um the globe and and these globalists uh, do seem to, at least I, I it may be more complicated it might might be more sophisticated than that but I tend to to frame the subject in terms of the globalists and the people who want to centralize more and more control and then there are people like me who want to decentralize control um, is that how you look at it or do you not I, I certainly uh would like to have less control over our lives by anybody, whoever they are. I mean, I, most bureaucrats in Washington or everywhere else uh, cannot run my life as well as I can run my life, even though I make plenty of mistakes, I assure you. But and I'm not sure who keeps pulling off these wars. I know they come from, from Washington, but I don't see that any of them have done any, either you or me of any of your listeners, any good. We've been in Afghanistan longer than any war in American history. I have no idea what we've gained. I have no idea why we're there. I have no idea where the money's gone. I can go on and on with other examples too. If you can name one war in the past 30 or 40 years that's been good for you and me, please do so. But I don't know about it. Well, in Afghanistan, you can ask some of the troops that come back from there. We sure do seem to be guarding poppy fields, and so heroin trafficking can't be too far away from that conversation if you really get behind the scenes. I don't know, oil and and uh, petroleum resources and pipelines can't be uh, too far from the answer to that question either. I wonder, I just listened to a great podcast from the Corbett Report that talked about in this new American globalist directive that we go around invading and occupying countries under the the guise of this responsibility to protect and um it just seems to be more of, of the same, uh, profit and control. And you wonder why the world uh, hates the United States. And We have troops in over 100 countries, which is costing us a lot of money and 
mainly from what I can gather, they're making enemies rather than friends. I mean, if a lot of countries had troops stationed in the United States, I'm sure that most of us would say, wait a minute, who are these guys? What are they doing here? They're not here for my benefit. Yeah. I'm afraid that's happening to us all over. Well, with this petrodollar, Jim, where do you seeing it going? Are, is the petrodollar doomed? Is Are people going to follow the lead of the Iranians and the Russians? How do you see it playing out? Well, the U.S. dollar has been, is and has been the world's reserve currency and medium of exchange for at least 70 years now. Uh, that is beginning to cause problems for many people and problems for us. In fact, we are now the largest debtor nation in the history of the world, and every country that's gotten itself into this kind of position in history has had problems, has had decline, crisis, semi-crisis, etc. It has given us, the U.S., or at least Washington, D.C., a large amount of control over the world, but now people are starting to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, we don't like this at all, and besides, your situation is deteriorating, so we've got to do something else. So some countries, China, Russia, well, there are several countries, there are dozens of countries, in fact, that have signed up to say we have to find an alternative to the U.S. dollar. It hasn't happened yet, but they're all working on it. They're starting up a new bank, uh, international bank, which will make it so that people can use other currencies besides the U.S. dollar. That's going to make Washington have less control over the world. Now, as far as I'm concerned, the world needs something to compete with the U.S. dollar. Any situation where you have a monopoly is usually not good you know, in the end. So we need something to compete with the U.S. dollar. And it's starting to happen, Dan. It's going to mean that Washington will have less control eventually. It will mean that they cannot print staggering amounts of money to do what they please. Now, I'm not in favor of printing money, so I'm delighted to see that we U.S. the U.S. will have to stop printing money, but it does mean we're going to have less control, which might be good in the end. If Jack Ma is right about his numbers and the staggering amounts of money we have spent on useless wars, we'd be better off if we didn't have all these useless wars. Well, what I fear in the case of Iran is if you look at the template uh, in our relatively um, uh, immediate history, when Libya and Iraq sought to sell oil in something other than the dollar. In the case of the Iraqis, it was the euro. In the case of Muammar Gaddafi, it was the gold-backed dinar. It meant that we destroyed their country. And with Russia backing Iran and not backing down, it appears, maybe the consequences and our reaction and other people's reaction to that reaction doesn't fare so well for the for their population or ours. Well, except for the fact that Iranians, as you pointed out, the Russians have said, wait a minute, wait a minute, you're not gonna you're not gonna attack Iran. The Chinese have said you're not gonna attack Iran. So oh my gosh, if we attack Iran and the Chinese and the Russians support them, huh, I don't know where I wanna be, but I certainly don't want to be close to anybody at that point. Yeah, Singapore is a probably a pretty good place. Well, Singapore is a wonderful place to be for many reasons, but and the the most important port in the world is in Singapore. Uh, and if you get out a map and look, you'll understand why. It's the, lar- it's the second largest port in the world right now. But everything that happens in Asia has to go through Singapore. So it's not, if there's war, you don't want to be in the most, imp- most strategic port in the world because everybody will want that port. So, yes, yeah, Singapore is great in many ways. I sure hope there's not a war, though, because everybody needs and wants that port. Why does everything go through Singapore in Asia? Get out a map and you'll see. It's, it's, it's on the way to everywhere, and it's on the way back. It's just everywhere. geographically advantageous. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. It's geography. It has nothing to do with whether the Singapore is smart or dumb, strong or weak. It just happens to be that this port is right where everything has to go, and it's a it's a fabulous port. It's deep. It's all it's all the things that you would want if you were designing a port. You know, nature gave Singapore everything you need in a great port, including the location. Uh, how do you feel about Bitcoin and gold these days, uh, Jim? Uh, Bitcoin seems to be gaining strength. They're both decentralized value. 
that maybe not completely beyond the control of, uh, of governments. They can certainly take actions and do take actions against both, but uh, they seem to be a wild card in this whole game. How do you, how do you see the two? Well, I, I own some gold. I haven't bought gold in a, in a long time, any substantial gold, but I own it and I'm waiting for opportunities to buy more. If it goes down, I hope I'm smart enough to buy a lot more gold because before this is over, gold is going to go up a whole lot, and in fact, gold may even turn into a bubble. It will certainly get overpriced. The world, the world, we, as we were discussing before, the world has a huge problem with money uh, and currency, and so the world is looking for solutions. And the computer has changed and is changing everything we know. So I, I suspect that the money problems, the currency problems, will be. Uh, resolved or changed or solved by the computer. Uh, whether it will be Bitcoin or not, I don't know. Usually the person who's first in something doesn't wind up being the great success or the great leader. It's, you know, IBM did not invent the computers, but everybody associates computers with IBM and with the great success. The people who were early in computers you never heard of because they disappeared. IBM survived. And I'm afraid that's the way it's going to be with money, too. That's the way it is with both these things. The problem, Dan, is all governments want money to be centralized and on the computer because then they can control everything. As you know, many countries are already abolishing or reducing the amount of cash that people can use. In India now, you cannot buy anything with over four or five thousand dollars in cash in France, no more than a thousand euros in cash. Some states in the U.S. the same way. So governments love the fact that they can centralize and control the use of cash and the money, but then they know everything we do. And eventually it's going to be on the computer. If you buy a cup of coffee, they will know where you bought it, how many cups you drink a day. Etc. Etc. And they love, love, love that. I, of course, don't love that because I don't want anybody controlling my life except me. Uh, but governments love it. So, unfortunately, I'm afraid that that will make the use of Bitcoin and any other electronic money uh, not very successful because, in the end, the governments are going to decide which electronic money we use. They will probably abolish the use of gold in transactions. They will not take it away from us, but, you know, you can't go into a store and buy buy something with gold anymore. It doesn't mean there won't be a black market, but it's not going to be as useful as it has been. Sometimes it does seem that um, the powers that be or the powers that shouldn't be, um, our governments, central bankers of the world, the people pulling the strings, whoever they may be. It does seem like they have all the power, and yet um, I hear in your voice, or you seem to imply that there was an inevitability to um, this uh, complete centralization and the cashless society, which I would also fear. I, I want control over my life, and, and that does give them the ultimate control. Um, but there also seems to be a pushback. We have this new wave of, of populism that's spreading throughout Europe. Certainly the election of uh, Donald Trump, it's a populist movement. Whether he actually follows through with his populist platforms that he, um, he ran on, the meme is catching on throughout the world. Do you still believe it's, it's inevitable that they're going to get their way and they're going to get a cashless society? Oh, yes, I know so. But I'm not, maybe not in the next four or eight years, Mr. Trump's around. I mean, that's, I'm talking about a much, much, much bigger picture than, the, than the, this decade. Uh, because it will take a while to abolish the use of cash. Just, I mean, too many people don't even have computers or, or mobile phones. Many people could not survive without the use of cash. But the trend is in that direction. The technology is in that direction. I said, we, we do have a pro many problems that the computer is changing. My children will never go to a post office when they're adults. My children will probably never go to a bank when they're adults. They may never go to a doctor or rarely go to a doctor when they're adults. So the computer is already changing everything we know. And that one is going to have the full support of every government in the world. And that gives them more and more control. 
own governments. The nature of the beast is that you like as much control as they can have. Isn't that the truth? But that's why we don't work for the government. Yep. <laughs> what do you what do you do, Jim? And I, I'm asking you that literally. Um, do you have a message for the people? Because the average person listening to this probably doesn't want a cashless society. The average person also wants control over his life, and whether he fully understands this subject or not, I, I think the average person also wants an answer to the question: What do you do? Do you have advice for him? Well. Always throughout history, when governments have too much control, you know, whether it's the Soviet, it doesn't matter which country throughout history, usually people do react and find ways to get around the government controls. Now, it, it, it comes at an expensive price sometimes. There are many people who are in the Soviet Union who are dead or in jail or everything else because they resisted. It. But eventually, of course, the Soviet Union fell because it was an absurd absurd concept and badly executed. I don't know. The only thing I can think of is, yes, eventually we will all use some gold and silver. It'll be black market. We'll use something. Gold and silver historically has been the thing that was used, even in the Soviet Union. You know, people found ways to use gold and silver. Not much, not much. But historically, that is the thing that people can use and do. But it will be on the black market because then they will make it illegal for you and me to go into a shop and use gold. It will only be you and I will it'll be on the black market. But black markets have existed throughout history. Uh, and by the way, black markets usually mean that the people, the pushback, as you put it, are reacting and saying, hey, there's something wrong. we got to find a way around these absurd controls and absurd regulations. And that's how black markets develop. Uh, I happen to think black markets are good. They're honest markets. They're people are reacting against uh, governments who've taken too much control and too much power. That's not the conventional wisdom of black markets because governments say, all governments say black markets are bad. Yeah. Well, what they're really saying is black markets are doing something against us. And that's why they think they're bad. Especially in light of that there really aren't markets much anymore, that uh, most everything is rigged. Gold is rigged, LIBOR is rigged, Forex is rigged, silver is rigged, even stocks and bonds are rigged. I mean, with high-frequency trading and these computers that you speak of, um, some people argue that they're, they aren't actually markets, that it's controlled on a, on a, a level that uh, has never been seen before in history. But do you put silver in a different category, Jim, because it is an industrial metal and it has other uses besides the store of value um, as a currency, so to speak? Right now, silver seems to be, the, the price of silver seems to be suppressed to a point where it's actually below the price of production. Do you see silver taking a different path? Uh, the, the fact that uh, silver is an industrial metal does make it less easy for governments to uh, to control it because, you know, too many people need it for industrial uses. Uh, and gold and silver frequently do move more or less together, but there have been many times in history when they've gone separate ways. So uh, if I had to buy one today, I would prefer to buy silver rather than gold. I own both, both of them, and expect to buy more somewhere down the road. But yes, they'll, they'll, we'll use both. Silver throughout history has been used more than gold as money, as currency, partly because there's so much more of it. And it's, it's you know, we've been in many other countries where they didn't have gold. In the U.S., we started off using silver back in, after, right after the revolution. Uh, so silver has a great, a great future. It will probably be more useful than gold in the future for many reasons including the fact that they, it's harder for governments to control it because they'll have to close down too many things if, if industry cannot use silver. I own both. And speaking of a message, Jim, I'm curious about something. Um, you don't seem to me to be a man who is selling something. I listen to the advice and the, the commentary of people that clearly are selling things like gold. They're, I mean, they're out on the internet um, selling their wares. You don't seem to be selling anything. 
I don't have anything to sell. <laughs> I wish I was smart enough to have something to sell. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm a simple person. I don't have anything. You find something for me to sell, I'll try to sell it. I doubt if I'd be very good at it, but I'll try. So I'm asking you, why are you doing this? Why do you take the time to, um, to, to commentate and to give advice and to, uh, to talk to the world through this medium? Well, mainly, Dan, because when I was young and when I started out, there were people who helped me, who would talk to me, who would answer my questions, uh, even though I was just you know, young and ambitious and trying to learn. And there were many, many, many people. I used to think, well, why is this guy talking to me? Why is he answering my questions? But they did. Many of them did. Of course, there were people who ignored me and, and, and wouldn't talk to me. But I remember many, many people who had to talk to me and answer my questions. And I don't know if anybody gets out of anything out of what I'm saying, but if nothing else, if I talk and they, it raises questions in people's minds, I'm happy to help because many people helped me in the past. Well, I appreciate you taking the time. Do you have a, um, oh, for the average American, not necessarily the investor. I know you're an investor, and certainly people tune in to listen to what you have to say in the investing world. For the average American, or for that matter, the average person who lives in Singapore, do you have advice for them right now to prepare? And What, what would that advice be? Well, my advice is, first of all, <laughs> Don't do anything that you yourself don't understand, which leads to please become knowledgeable, figure out and understand what's going on in the world, because then we're going to have some very complicated and difficult times in the next few years. So I urge everybody to learn as much as they can to become knowledgeable about what's happening. And once they become knowledgeable, they're going to get worried. I assure you they're going to be worried. And once they become worried, I hope they will figure out ways to protect themselves or courses of action to take. Don't, don't listen to me. Don't do what I'm doing unless you yourself know a lot about it, unless you yourself understand it and agree. One of the worst things people can do is just follow blind advice they see on TV or the Internet or in the newspaper. Then something happens and they don't know what they, why they did it in the first place and they wind up losing money. So please become knowledgeable. Then you'll be worried, and then you'll figure out what to do. And I'm not asking for um, a prediction or timing, but do you feel these tough times are imminent? Do you think we have much longer? No, it's, it's, it's certainly going to happen. Since you mentioned Mr. Trump, it's going to happen in Mr. Trump's uh, time in, in office, in his first term. No, it's, it's coming. It's happening now. It's, it's, you're, Japan's already in in recession. Uh, many parts of the world are in recession now. There's staggering amounts of money which has been printed everywhere. Then in 2008, the world had a problem because of too much debt. The debt now is much, much, much higher than it was in 2008 and 2009. Debt everywhere has gone through the roof. Money printing is like we've never seen in history has taken place. No, it start, it's happening. It's starting now. You don't see it on the television, the internet at the moment, but you're going to. Uh, thank you, Jim Rogers, for taking the time to uh, share your thoughts and your experience and your insights uh, and being on New Culture Radio. My pleasure, man. Let's do it again sometime. Thank you. Today.